Good morning. Thank you for um, staying on for this session. So before we um, progress with the presentation, I would like to if you go to the next slide. Oh, that's me. Thank you. So we recognize and pay our respects to the elders and communities, past, present, and emerging of the Yagera, Yugera, and Ugarapu peoples, who are the traditional owners of this land. And we are guests here. We actually come from the land of the Gadigo people of the Eora Nation. So for thousands of years, they have shared and exchanged knowledge knowledges across innumerable generations for, for the benefit of all. And we also extend our respect to the elders and communities of the lands across Australia, and also the lands on which the University of Sydney campuses are built, the Gadigo of the Eora Nation. So uh, this is, I don't know why we were asked to put the pictures there, but that's us in case. <laughs> Thank you. I believe it's for other purposes. So um, just as a way of introduction, so my role is Pro Vice Chancellor of Student Life and Victor here. Introduce this. I'm, I'm Victor, I'm a recent, um, I recently graduated. I used to study UX and art history and now I work with Susanna and the Student Life team. Thank you, Victor. So I don't know whether you, you know about this, but in, uh, in 2023, so this is a first year, first intake, the University of Sydney introduced what is called the My Sydney Scholarship Program. And so this is a, um, effectively a, a way to uh, support students who come from diverse backgrounds, in particular uh, students who come from low socioeconomic and experience disadvantage. And what we would like to do with that is to uh, provide a financial support, but also support for university, for, for students who succeed while they are at university. And that includes all sorts of different types of, um, of academic and social support. So obviously when we talk about diversity, as Lucy explained to us this morning, um, we are talking about intersectional uh, diversity. So with the University of Sydney decided to, um, to use that low socioeconomic indicator as a way to um, reduce at least one barrier to access. And also the way in which the scholarship is set up, uh, students don't actually have to apply. So, because it will perceive to be a barrier as well. So effectively, when students go via the UAC, which is the recruitment process in New South Wales, I believe probably also here. And so when they put in um, that and you see it as um, they have an expression of interest for that university and they, they qualify because they are, um, their address is in a specific location, they, they are offered $8,500 a year for the duration of the degree. So before we had an, a program where they received support for the first year of the study, but that obviously wasn't uh, necessarily um, an effective way to support them because after the first year, what do you do? So this is meant to support them for the duration. It's set at 8,500 because you can still then be eligible for Centrelink and you can also do a little bit of part-time work if you do it. And we believe that supporting them for the duration of degree was the way to. So that's one barrier. But that's not the end of it. So within that, uh, we then try to focus on other types of um, supposed barriers that students might encounter or other ways in which their success could be um, compromised. So how do you support students who um, who come from, who have experienced perhaps disadvantage, and how do you make sure that you don't just invite them to come, but you actually change your institution so that you don't uh, ask them to become you, you kind of really change yourself. And I suppose this sort of speaks a little bit to what Lucy was um, discussing today as well, right? So how does the leadership, for instance, of the institution how does the community of the, of the institution uh, changes and 
becomes not just inclusive, but really diverse in, its, in, in the way it works. Now, the, what, what we know so know is that once you, so we invited the students to come, we are supporting them with uh, some financial support, but then the other way in which we wanted to support them is by making sure that we really focus on, on engagement and finding your community. So that's why I, I mentioned before that we, we want to also change ourselves so that you know we can create communities where um, we can support each other. And so we know that engagement and community are very much correlated with uh, retention, student satisfaction, but more importantly, success. Success not according to whether you get a very high mark, but success according to what, what do you want to achieve? You know, and are you succeeding in your measure of you know of um, of your your wishes, you know your desires of what you want success to look like for you? And so, the problem with Sydney Uni is that I don't know how many of you have, have been to that campus, but you walk into Sydney Uni and you look at those um, sandstone buildings. They speak very much of so many different things, right? They speak of colonization. They speak of um, what do you call it? <laughs> Power, I suppose. They, they, and unless you feel that you are part of that group, right? Just being in that place can actually make make you feel very much alienated, or perhaps you feel like I don't belong here. And so, what does it look like then for a university like that to be welcoming and truly supportive of students who come from diverse backgrounds who might or might not appreciate? Um, sandstone buildings or feel indeed feel that you know they can belong within those walls and so um, that's there were the challenges that we faced when we were trying to think about how to create an inclusive uh, support program for those students um, and how do we create the networks that are going to be um, that are going to be that are going to be that can allow the students to feel at home in a place like that so clearly it's not going to be coming from us, right? It's clearly not, as uh, I think um, Sean this morning was talking about that, you know, these people sitting in a room uh, who might have no idea about, you know, what they are doing in relation to supporting students because there is no lived experience of that. Or if there is a lived experience, it's a lived experience that is lived some somewhere else, right? Not necessarily at that time. So, so what we've done then, we have decided that we needed to co-design with, with that cohort. And we needed to do it in a way that um, was very much embedding within the institution and within the structures of power of the institution and, and the governance of that institution. And we need to pay for our students for that contribution. We couldn't just go to students and say, can you please help, uh, help us co-design programs to support you and you do it for free. And we also didn't want it for that co-design work to be sitting somewhere outside of the governance. And so we set up what we are calling the My Sydney Scholars Student Liaison Committee. And this is very much to amplify that voice that can be also quiet. And when I say that is because what you have uh, in a place like University of Sydney is a lot of students who went to schools where they had debating teams and they had all lot of different ways in which they were effectively schooled in speaking, in creating a voice and making, and their voice is often the voice that is recognized by those in power as being the right voice. Um, so we have set up this, um, this um, committee, we call it a committee on purpose because it's very much the committee that is um, working across the institution. So we recruited the students and Victor can talk more about that in a minute. And we set it up as a liaison committee that effectively designs and um, evaluates the effectiveness of all support programs, academic and co-curricular programs that are um, going to be um, that are effectively developed as we speak, and, and they will be part of what we are offering and uh, to the students in the future. And so this is really important because it is about um, listening and is also giving power to those who are um, 
often, as I said, you know, with a voice that might not be necessarily recognized as legitimate and giving it an institutional location because their committee is very much the implementation committee and then informs the work that we do and informs how we do the imp continuous improvement and the evaluation. And then it feeds into the steering committee and it feeds into the university executive. So it's a very important uh, voice. And the most important thing is that we pay. And so it, it was also another way to, um, to make sure that we give, it, it, we, we help and we pay for the help the students are giving us. We pay for their contribution, and we also work with those students to um, to learn from each other what their voice could look like and the effectiveness of that. So the purpose of my Sydney Scholars Student Liaison Committee then is very much to establish a, a real partnership with students. So it's not about designing programs and then asking students to give feedback, but it's effectively to design together. Uh, and that particular group of students are very much um, designing what we are doing now and future initiatives. And it is very much designed with them, by them, and for them, for the students. It also, uh, what we try to do in that space, therefore, is to really try to understand how can you embed um, a student voice within a university, whole of university coordinated approach so that, that the student experience is, um, me, so that the student experience is effectively part of what, uh, what we are co-creating together. We also wanted to provide a platform and a mechanism for uh, this particular cohort of students to develop uh, leadership opportunities. And when we talk about leadership, we're not talking about obviously becoming, I don't know, the president of something or uh, in charge of something, but is that kind of shared, is leadership to make a change, leadership for social good. You know, it's, it's a leadership where you're working in partnership and you are actually doing and um, something that can change for the better, we hope, you know, the lives of others. And so that's when we wanted to work with this group of students to try to understand what that could look like. And we actually learned a lot in the process of doing that. So very quickly, I wanted to show you the, how that works in relation to the roles of the My Sydney Scholars leaders and how that works within the governance uh, structure that I mentioned before. I just wanted to give you a bit of a um, diagram for that. So you can see that the My Sydney leaders have in the, are very much at the center of the round. So it's on purpose because that's what we want to do. We always, um, the way we work in student life is that the students are at the center of everything we do. And therefore we need to really do it in a way where the governance and the structures reflect that. Um, so it's about, um, creating that is not just listening, but actually creating the opportunities for, for that voice to speak and to be heard. So I think that I might stop here and, uh, and then Victor can go, I'll go to the next slide. Um, and this is very much how we implemented in my Sydney Scholar Student Liaison Committee. And I think I, I mentioned before sort of what we want in trying to do in that space. So we want to try to really um, understand how we are supporting students, not just with their financial, um, you know, reducing the financial barrier, but also really looking at how we are supporting students with uh, the way in which they establish communities and relationships and how they, they relate to the university in, in relationship to changing the university, but also how we can support students in feeling very much part of that um, of their environment. You want to go to the next slide? How we how do we do it? How do we hire the students, and how we do, how we working in that space? Hi everyone. So, like I mentioned, I used to work as a student partner with the uni, and I was an equity student leader. So it's really awesome that I now look after the my Sydney scholar leaders. So in June, we had our hiring process. Candidates were recent high school graduates. Some had no experience at all, and some had lots of great leadership experience. But it was important to account for both of these student types and many, many more, because we wanted a variety of students and skills at the table rather than just one particular student type. We don't want to fill all the positions with one person who happens to be very good at speaking, for instance. 
Um, I remember when I was in high school, my high school didn't actually offer any um, leadership opportunities. So for me, it's not a personal issue to do with the student, but like a social issue to do with a school. Um, and especially because we're hiring for a co-design uh, advisory group, we want to um, understand the multifaceted nature of the Mycenae experience, not just one particular student within the Mycenae experience. So we hired based on various degrees, experiences, ATARs, and also the motivations written in a cover letter. Interview day um, rolled around, which was really exciting. Before the interview, we briefed facilitators um, to expand their definition of a successful candidate. These were recent high school graduates, and I told, we told them that it was important that it's okay for students to stutter or stumble or to be nervous in their interview. Um, candidates were then allocated to Zoom breakout rooms based on faculties and how we um, designed the interview session so that it was more, so that, so that we facilitated more diverse means of expression was that we did Padlet activities. So first students would have to um, write a question, like a short paragraph to a question such as what was a challenge you faced as a Mycenae student transitioning to uni? And then they'll talk in their groups. So there was this element of written expression and verbal expression to account for various different voices and also quieter voices. And out of this process, 15 candidates were selected. And this um, sort of design was to account for the fact that sometimes verbal communication can seem, be seen as this dominant marker of success, success in an interview. So we had this written element to account for more diverse voices. The interviews served as two purposes. So one purpose was we hired individuals, but we also learned a lot about the Mycenae cohort. Um, so through those questions, such as what were the challenges, we collated these, recorded them, and thematically analyzed them with previous focus group data, and that helped design the onboarding session. The onboarding session was super, super cute. We had like a free lunch and we got to meet everyone, but the main aim of that was to, so we've identified some challenges in the interviews, and now we're trying to really understand and expand on them. So they engaged in craft-based activities. On a comic, they charted emotional and physical aspects of their transition to uni, and on a large poster, they dreamed big and drew out their ideal community. During this, there's, there was also time for verbal expression, so they chatted amongst each other and reported back. One of the students, it was really funny, they um, said that they felt like a child again, um, which is really funny, but I just wanted to highlight how we were designing not for what, like Susanna said, it wasn't like a UN debate style club type of thing. It was people coming together, drawing and having chats. And like I saw students chatting with one another and exchanging Instagrams and making friends. So there was concurrent generation of knowledge. And so with highlighters and pens in hand, um, they sort of felt a particular way. And I think that's the magic of craft-based activities. It was also really important to um, teach students about Taroni's conception of dissent. So in group discussion, teams often come to a consensus led by a dominant voice in the group. But because we're a co-design group, we want to understand um, a variety of voices, like quiet voices. So to make so, so um, the students would learned that they were experts in their lived experience and that they had a responsibility to put their unique values on the table because they're experts in their own lived experience. And when they do that, they actually expand what counts as a Mycenae experience. And these were some of the outcomes, like a little taster on some of the outcomes from that onboarding session. I just wanted to highlight the diverse forms of expression. So we have a little sketch of a very disheveled looking person, a little comic. Someone wants to hang out at like a op shop place in Western Sydney. And someone is describing 
um, the ideal community. But we have sketches, comics, annotations, but also verbal um, recordings. So, I mean, verbal quotes. So we also took down what the students said and recorded them. And I actually have a whole stack of papers um, and I guard them almost with my life because they <laughs> contain all my <laughs> notes. <clears throat> and from that onboarding session, we, um, it was really important that we recorded those insights, but also thematically analyze them so we could really action them and start working on them. So onboarding insights were thematically analyzed to form five working groups that also aligned with staff priorities. In 2024, we have comms, co-curriculars, local hangouts and study sessions, exams and assessments, and welcome and transition. I'll now pass back to Susanna. Just very quickly to finish. So what you see there, those um, elements that uh, those different working groups are working on, how do the students are telling us and they are creating, how do, we com how do they communicate with each other, how we communicate with them, how we support them in the co-curricular space, and uh, how we support them with preparation for exams and assessment and so on. And uh, what will happen now is that the committee will continue to meet. The committee meets every six weeks because it's the opportunity for them to share with the faculties and the schools who have representation in that space. I chair their group as well. But the students meet, um, and Vic, Victor works with them and with others in the team, meets in between those six weeks so that you know, they are prepared for when they are presenting at their committee. And then each, because there are students from every school and faculty, they then also work with their own school and faculties to inform the work that those schools and faculties do along or for those different ones, that like co-curricular support for, for uh, exams and so on. So you can see how we've been trying to embed the student voice, to give it um, for us to learn, to do it in real partnership, and then to change the institution from the bottom up. And that's what we hope to do with this program. Thank you. <laughs>